glazed all our lives. Desperate business is brought to you by Rogue Nun Productions. Welcome to Misty River, an affluent American mountain town filled with secrets and scandal. Our story begins months after Sister Indica moved in with her lover Vincenzo, head of the Valducci crown family and father of one of her best friends, Giovanni. Their time together had felt like a fairy tale. They travelled the world, bought a cottage in Italy and even eloped to Las Vegas. They never fought and he doted on her making sure she and their growing baby were well taken care of. Sister Indica had never been loved like this, and rather than push it away, she welcomed it. She refused to allow past relationship traumas to ruin what she and Vincenzo had. She drank in every bit of joy, and it was healing her. Today we find our heroine sipping herbal tea, looking out of her office's panoramic windows. The Misty River mountain ranges were covered in heavy snow, and black clouds were rolling in. Winter was coming early. Sister... I have those numbers prepared for today's meeting. Ethan, business has never been better. We're really socking it to Apollo Media Enterprises. Come on in, I just put on a fresh pot of tea. <laughs> I'll be right there. Moments later, Ethan Colfax, Sister Indica's new executive administrative assistant, was walking into her office holding a beautifully decorated kick. Following him was Bianca Wolf. Co-president of Rogue Nun Productions, Zoe Robinson, Bianca's girlfriend, and Pandora Destranger, Sister Indica's dearest friend. They had balloons and gifts and were all wearing festive party hats. Sister Indica's smile filled the room. <laughs> what is going on here? Well, since you and Vincenzo have been gallivanting all over the world, we never got the chance to give you a proper baby shower, bitch. You look like you could pop at any second, so we figured now is the time. And you know I love to throw a good old party. Oh, Ethan, you gaze in your event planning. I accepted no help from Bianca and Zoe, though. Otherwise, the Indigo Girls would be here with something vegan. Not all lesbians are vegan and listen to the Indigo Girls, Ethan. You have all their albums, Zoe. All right, children, back to me. Oh, and <laughs> this baby. I see you've all brought gifts. You guys should know that you are my gift, and I want nothing more than your love. <laughs> but let's tear these motherfuckers open anyway. The gang retired to the sitting area. Pandora was first to hand Sister Indica a present. Now this isn't for the baby. It's for you to enjoy the moment this kid vacates your uterus. <laughs> I swear, Pandora, if it's a vibrator, I'm going to kick your ass. Ha! <laughs> okay, now we're talking. A box of perfectly rolled blunts. Morgana would be so proud. Oh, Pandora, I love you, bitch. I don't feel so weird about my gift now. This one is for you, too. Oh, Bianca, what are you up to? <laughs> Aw, a bottle of Belvedere, my favorite vodka. Is this your guys' not-so-subtle way of saying sober, pregnant me is boring? Well... <laughs> <laughs> you assholes. Well, I actually remembered that I was coming to a baby shower, so I got you this. Oh, I know this is going to be good, Zoe. You did just become the owner of Goldie's, my absolute favorite boutique in all of Misty River. All right, let's see what this is. Oh my God, Zoe, it's perfection. A baby-sized mink coat. As soon as you told me you were having a baby girl, I had this made for you. I'm sorry, guys. These hormones are driving me crazy. Ugh. This is the cutest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. I kind of wish I didn't have to follow that gift. Uh, here you go, sis. This is also for the baby. But, spoiler alert, it's not for... 
<laughs> you don't exactly make miniature fur coat money. Yet. Oh, Ethan! Would you look at this? A baby-sized turban. I rhinestoned it myself. It's Swarovski. Ooh, let me get that for you. Thank you, Ethan. You guys are really too good to me. Thank you so much for doing this. I love you all. We love you too, girl. I just wish Giovanni could be here, but he was called out of the country on some urgent family business. I wonder whose legs he's going to break. Pandora, watch it. Girl, I'm just playing with you. I know you miss him. I can't imagine having this baby without him here. And I know she's coming any day now. Look at me. I'm enormous. You're beautiful. Thank you, Bianca. As much as I've enjoyed this pregnancy, I am so excited about getting my body back. Mama needs to get fucked up, kid. Amen to that. How's everything going with the bookstore, Pandora? Oh, everything's great. How's Dante? Yes, spill it. I heard you two are finally an item. Dante's fine. Oh, girl, we all know he's fine. Y'all are terrible. Dante and I are doing well, but it's so new I don't want to jinx it, you know? Let's revisit this discussion in a few months and we'll see how it's going then. Ethan, can you put a reminder on my calendar? <laughs> all right, all right, enough about me. Bianca girl, you have been killing it as co-president of Rogue Nun Productions. Natalie Winter has been really gunning for you on her show. That bitch talks so much shit she should wipe her mouth with toilet paper. Thank you, Pandora. I guess it's a good sign that I'm on her radar. That means she's threatened. But I'm only following the great example Indica has set. We're a team. A great team. Oh, please, Bianca. I would never have gotten Rogue Nun to where it is today without you. This is all you. At this point, I'm just signing the checks. Okay, fine. I'm amazing. What can I say? I knew you had it in you, babe. I'm so proud of you. I love you. All right, all right. Don't start scissoring on my couch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so who's going to cut this fucking cake? Rosie Bush sat behind her desk at Apollo Media Enterprises, reviewing the company's latest numbers. Her months as co-president hadn't brought the results she was hoping for. Turning Rogue Nun Productions around was a breeze. Why couldn't she do the same for AME? She sensed that Natalie Winter was getting impatient with her. Her sole purpose for hiring Rosie was to aid in the destruction of Sister Indica and Rogue Nun Productions, ensuring Natalie would take over as Mr. Rivers' queen of all media. How much time would Natalie give her to deliver the goods? She surmised that it wasn't long. Rosie sighed and put her head down for a moment. She had been working day and night and was utterly exhausted. She'd never worked this hard in her life. She'd barely even held a job prior to taking over Rogue Nun Productions. Hers had been a life of Privilege, leisure, and unbelievable wealth. She only went to a prestigious university because that is simply what one did, not because she had any real career goals. When she was young, her father was the mayor of Misty River. He was so popular that they allowed him to serve a staggering four terms. She thought of how proud of her he'd be if he were to see how much effort she was putting into something other than shopping. Her mother, the child of Greek aristocrats, couldn't be bothered with her daughter. Her focus was on entertaining Misty River's political circle and the elite. Rosie was simply an annoying footnote. Rosie was happy that her mother had moved to Mykonos so many years ago. Just then, Natalie Winter burst into Rosie's office. Wake up, Rosie. Have you seen this quarterly report? Rogue Nun is killing us. Ugh, but wake, Natalie. I literally just put my head down for a second. I'm exhausted. I think these 17-hour days are catching up with me. We can sleep when we're number one. Right now, we're number two. And we both know number two means we are shit. Do you want to be shit, Rosie? Do you want to lose? Did you forget whom we're up against? Ugh, no one knows better than me whom we are up against. I'm doing my best, Natalie. 
We both have the same goal, to see Rogue Nun Productions crushed and Sister Indica humiliated. It's just gonna take more time. We don't have the luxury of time. We tried going the professional route by hiring new talent, creating new content, but it's time we got dirty. It's the only way we're going to win, Rosie. I'm on board with whatever we need to do. Even if it's illegal? Natalie, has that ever stopped me before? Who knows anymore, Rosie? You have been dating Detective Jim Brinkman, so as far as I know, you've gone soft. I assure you, Natalie, I have not gone soft. My relationship with Jim has no bearing on my desire to destroy Sister Indica by any means necessary. I just need a couple days off to catch up on sleep and be re-energized for the fight. Before Natalie could respond, Joanne Michaels was rushing into Rosie's office, a cup of coffee in each hand. I thought you'd need a pick-me-up, boss. Thank you, Joanne. You are so thoughtful. We'll continue this conversation later, Rosie. I'll see you in a couple of days. Get some rest. When you get back, we're going full tilt nuclear winter on Rogue Nun. Natalie stomped out of Rosie's office, leaving she and Joanne alone. Boy, Natalie sure seemed upset. Joanne, she's livid. Our numbers are dismal, so I really can't blame her. She was so generous to offer me this position. I don't want to let her down. If there's anyone who can take down Rogue Nun, it's the person who used to run it. Don't give her so much credit, though. She'd toss you out in a heartbeat. I can tell she's ruthless. I'm keeping an eye on her. Joanne, when you're right, you're right. At least this job has given us a chance to work together. It's so nice having you back. The real you. Natalia's practically a faint, albeit painful, memory. I don't remember her at all. And I never want to. I can't imagine hurting you, or that any part of me would ever want to. That brainwashing is pretty powerful stuff. The brain is a mysterious thing, Joanne. I doubt we'll ever unlock all its wonders. This is Rosie. Oh, hello, Jim. You're downstairs. What perfect timing. I was just wrapping up for the day. I'll be right down. (laughs) I love you, too. Jim's here. Will I see you at home later tonight? You sure will. I've been rearranging the kitchen. It's pots and pans night. (laughs) (laughs) Joanne, you don't need to do that. I love doing it. It relaxes me. Well, a relaxed Joanne is a happy Joanne. You have my full support. Have fun with your pots and pans. Rosie gathered her coat and purse and left Joanne alone in her office. While Joanne sipped her coffee, a strange tingling sensation came over her, starting at the crown of her head and snaking down her spine. It had become a regular occurrence since her brainwashing was reversed. She'd just assumed it was some kind of side effect. She'd become used to it, but the lapses in time concerned her. Sometimes it would be minutes, other times hours... She didn't want to worry Rosie, so she kept it to herself, hoping it would just fade over time. She put her coffee down and sat in a comfortable chair. The tingles increased. She closed her eyes and waited for it to pass. A few moments later, she opened her eyes, got to her feet, and went into Rosie's private bathroom. She grabbed a brush and began running it through her hair, transforming her wild, messy curls into a chic style. There was a tube of blood-red lipstick on the vanity. She opened it and expertly applied it to her pouty lips. She then retrieved a blazer and pair of heels from Rosie's closet. Before switching off the light, she looked into the mirror. It's Natalia Beach. Meanwhile, Jim and Rosie were driving to his place for dinner. You seem stressed. How are you holding up? Oh, Jim... I'm just burning the candle from both ends, I guess. Toppling the town's biggest media empire is quite the task, even for a woman as imposing as I. I'm taking a couple days off to relax and recharge. Won't you join me? Crime never stops in a place as corrupt as Misty River. As much as I'd like to play house with you, I'm afraid duty calls. So, how is Joanne doing with her new role at Apollo Media Enterprises? She's always been a fantastic assistant. And for the most part, she's attacking the job hammer and tongs. But something is off with her. I can't pinpoint it, but something is definitely wrong. 
I'd worry more if I weren't so much in love with you. Rosie snuggled up next to Jim, whose eyes remained firmly on the road ahead. After all these years, we finally found our way back to each other. How did I get so damn lucky? Don't analyze it, Jim. Just enjoy it. Vincenzo sat in his library, trying to enjoy a cigar and vodka. Martini. Life with Sister Indica had been so good, almost like a dream, that it filled him with dread. Why couldn't he just live in the moment and be happy? Why must he always worry that a shoe was about to drop? When his late wife died many years ago, he thought he'd never love again. But he did, and with someone he loved more than life itself. On top of that, he was going to be a father again. A precious baby girl was about to come into his life, and rather than be over the moon, he was terrified. Sometimes he fantasized about leaving the country and moving to a remote island alone so that no one would be subjected to his dark moods. But that was just a fantasy. He now had Sister Indica and this new baby to take care of, and he loved them, he truly did, but the feeling that he'd disappoint them was unshakable. Suddenly, the fireplace shifted, and Fiona and Dimitri emerged from the secret passageway. Must you use that? We have other doors, you know. What can I say, Vincenzo? I like the drama of it all. And must you be in such a sour mood? There are other emotions, you know. Go to hell, Fiona. Well... I suggest you snap out of it, because we have a guest arriving shortly. Ugh. Who? Our darling father, of course. Mr. Walducci's jet has landed, and driver is bringing him from airport as we speak. Vincenzo stood and threw his martini angrily into the roaring fire. Ah, uh, that wife of yours sure is rubbing off on you, ain't she? I'm leaving. The hell you are! Who do you think he's coming to see? You can't avoid him, Vincenzo. One way or another, you will see him. I've been instructed to neutralize you. You won't believe it. How dare you? You work for me. Incorrect. I work for Fausto. What the hell does that old bastard want anyway? I think it's best that you hear it directly from Daddy. You just sit tight. All your questions will be answered shortly. You should probably pour yourself another drink. <laughs> You're going to need it. The minutes moved at a glacial pace. Finally, Vincenzo heard the front doors opening and the sound of a cane tapping rhythmically against the marble floor. The old man was making his way to the library. Vincenzo's chest and shoulders tightened while Fiona smiled broadly, her hands clasped together in excitement. The sound of the cane stopped. Vincenzo held his breath. Is a someone going to open these goddamn doors? Fiona's face fell and she ran to the doors, flinging them open as if they had personally offended her. Oh, Daddy, I'm so sorry. Here, let me help you. Grab my arm. My darling Fiona, I'd forgive you anything. Yes, uh, please help your dear father. Don't trouble yourself, Vincenzo. As usual, your sister does what you simply cannot. To what do we owe the honor of your presence, Father? Don't patronize me, Vincenzo. Have you forgotten whose house you are living in? And whose money you are spending hand over feast? I do not ask for your respect, my son. I demand it! You're right, sir. I, I'm sorry for the disrespectful tone. Welcome home, Father. That's a bit. Fiona held Fausto into a chair and took his cane. Can I make you a drink, Daddy? My doctor said I shouldn't have scotch anymore. <laughs> but he isn't a here, is he? <laughs> here you are, Daddy. Salute. Salute. Ooh, that's smooth. You always know what I like, my darling Fiona. Before we get down to business, I wanted to tell you how pleased I am with you, Dimitri. You've been a loyal and impressive soldier. You have a sharp mind and aren't afraid to do what must be done. 
You are invaluable and you have my gratitude. Thank you, Mr. Walducci. It is honor to serve you and this family. I reward such loyalty and performance. Fiona, uh, get my briefcase from the hallway. Fiona ran to the hall and retrieved Faster's black briefcase. Should I open it for you, Daddy? <laughs> I am not so frail that I cannot open a briefcase. I did carry it inside, darling girl. Fast as gnarled fingers released the clasps on the briefcase, opening it to reveal what looked to be thousands of dollars. For you, Dimitri. Mr. Walducci is very generous. I thank you deeply. You have more than earned this. Vincenzo, I hope you've been taking notes. Dimitri could teach you a lot. I agree with you, Father. Dimitri is very impressive. Dimitri. I must ask you, this brainwashing you did on, uh, what's her name? Joan Matthews. Joanne Michaels. Ah, yes, Joanne Michaels. What you were able to do with her is beyond anything I have ever seen. And trust me, <laughs> I have seen it all. Thank you. I learned so much in my time as high-ranking official in Russian army. Brainwashing is my specialty. It is an art. And you are Michelangelo. You are too kind. I actually have this device that allows me to control Joanne. I can transform her into Natalia with flip of a switch. The process was very technical, but effective. In fact, Natalia is on her way here now. It was going to be a surprise. Speak of devil. I'll get it. Moments later, Vincenzo returned with Natalia. Natalia, dobri den. Privet, papa. You even taught her Russian. Da, she was very quick learner. Joanne must have high IQ. Vaza, are you going to introduce me to your friend? My dearest daughter, this is Mr. Fausto Walducci patriarch of the Walducci family and our boss. It is pleasure to be meeting you, Mr. Valducci. The pleasure is all mine, Natalia. Please forgive me for not standing. I am an old man in ailing health. Ailing health? What do you mean, Daddy? Yes, Fiona. It's one of the reasons I am here. We have a much to discuss, all of us. The kitchen was a foreign place to Rosie Bush. As long as she could remember, a nanny, butler or maid was always available to make her meals. However, for Jim Brinkman, who was the eldest child in a middle-class family, it was a sanctuary. Making meals for his family had always been an expression of love and... Now Rosie was his favourite person to cook for. After finishing dinner, he did the dishes and then hopped into the shower to prepare for bed. Rosie retired to the living room with a gin martini and the latest copy of Sess magazine. She thumbed through the pages before stopping on an article about Zoe Robinson taking over Goldie's boutique. A lump formed in her throat and her pulse quickened. Suddenly, Jim appeared tussling his wet, curly brown hair with his fingers, only a towel covering his trim, athletic body. What you reading? In a panic, Rosie slammed the magazine shut. Oh, nothing. Just garbage. I don't know why I bother. It's all gossip and cosmetic ads. You seemed upset. Ever the detective. If you truly must know, this is what I was reading. Rosie flipped through the magazine and showed him an article on global warming. I didn't think you were such an environmentalist. Climate change is going to cause water levels to rise significantly. I own real estate on the Virgin Islands. Think of the money I'll lose. <laughs> There's my Rosie. Are you going to join me in bed? Oh, Jim, not tonight. I'm going to go home, take a long soak in my tub, and then sleep until noon. My driver will be here shortly to take me home, so you go off to bed. 
I'll call you tomorrow. Good night, my love. Good night, Jim. Rez's driver arrived shortly after Jim went to bed. She rode in the back of her limousine, her heart pounding and her mind racing. She hated lying to Jim, but she couldn't bear seeing the pain her honesty would cause. For decades, the Robinson family were blissfully out of sight and out of mind. However, now that Zoe was becoming such a successful entrepreneur, those days were over. Her star was rising thanks to her business acumen and media empire running girlfriend, Bianca Wolf. Though it was inevitable that Jim would see Zoe in the press, Rosie certainly wasn't going to expedite the process. When faced with a choice to pay now or pay later, Rosie generally opted for the latter. It had been almost 30 years since Jim accidentally shot and killed Zoe's mother, but the incident has always haunted them. They were just teenagers, and thankfully Rose's father was able to use his power as Mr. Rivers' mayor to keep Jim protected. But the incident sent Jim to a prison of another kind, a mental one that never allows for parole. She loved him so and wanted nothing more than for him to forgive himself and put the accident out of his memory forever. If only Dmitri Sokolov could brainwash it out of him. Rosie's driver pulled through the gates of her mansion. She gathered her things and she stepped out of the limousine. Her legs betrayed her and she collapsed onto the driveway. Her driver helped her to her feet, but she declined his offer to accompany her inside. She regained her footing and carefully made her way through the large mahogany doors and slowly up the stairs to the master's suite. Meanwhile... Yet Bianca Wolf's cottage, she and Zoe Robinson were sipping glasses of red wine in front of a roaring fire. What's going on, hun? You've barely said two words all night. Oh, it's nothing. I just had a long day. Do you think Indica liked her surprise baby shower? Are you kidding? Your gift made her cry. Well, your gift and those raging hormones. <laughs> well... She's not just your boss. She's a good friend of yours. I want her to like me. I want all your friends to like me. We really haven't been dating that long. Everyone loves you. You're kind, thoughtful, generous, and have the best set of tits in town. If you're lucky, maybe I'll uh, show them to you later. Maybe I'll let you touch them. The women kissed and Zoe cuddled up closer to Bianca. Mm, Indica's so lucky. I've always wanted a baby. My biological clock won't shut up about it. What about you? (laughs) Zoe, we don't even live together yet. I don't mean right this second. Just in general. The thought has crossed my mind over the years, but I'd much rather be in a boardroom than a nursery. I think part of the reason I want one so bad is because I grew up without a mother. She died when I was so young. I want to be the mother that I never had. Is that selfish? I think it's perfectly understandable. I don't know about you, but I'd like to finish this bottle of wine in bed. We just got in some new lingerie at Goldie's, and I may have picked out something that will improve your mood. You think lingerie can do all that? Oh, yes. How about you go upstairs and get ready while I put out the fire? Zoe kissed Bianca deeply, grabbed the bottle of wine, and scampered upstairs. Bianca opened the fireplace and used a poker to spread out the embers. She hadn't been honest with Zoe. It wasn't just a long day that was bothering her. It was Apollo Media Enterprises. Natalie Winter and Rosie Bush working together was like gasoline and matches. Inevitably, there would be an explosion and God knows who'd end up as collateral damage. Being promoted to co-president was both blessing and curse. She had more power, money and influence. But it also put her in the crosshairs of all Rogue Nun's rivals, namely Apollo. She didn't trust Natalie, and she certainly didn't trust Rosie. It was only a matter of time before they found the information they'd need to completely destroy Rogue Nun. Why did she agree to come back to Rogue Nun? Her ambition and greed got the best of her once again. Would she ever learn? Bianca put the fireplace poker back in its holder. The fire was out for now, but she knew an inferno was just on the horizon. (laughs) 
Dinner at the Valducci mansion was slow and tense. Vincenzo kept waiting for Fausto to explain what important news he had and why he made this trip to Mr. River, but instead they took meandering trips down memory lane. Fausto's childhood in Italy, his godlike father Luca, Vincenzo's sainted mother Stella. Fausto shared more about his life in one evening than Vincenzo learned over the last fifty years. Was it because Fausto never shared, or Vincenzo never listened? At last the meal came to a close, and Fausto suggested they all retire to the library for an after-dinner scotch. Fiona and Natalia both helped Fausto get settled into a chair, while Vincenzo poured everyone drinks. My deepest thank you for indulging an old man this evening. When you get to a certain age, it feels like all you have is memories. Everyone leaves you. It is the nature of life. It doesn't matter if you fear it. Or if you understand it, life and death, just these. You've had a fascinating life, Mr. Valducci. It is honor to learn from you. Drinks? Vincenzo handed everyone a glass of scotch. Thank you, Vincenzo. I would like to make a toast. The only thing that has ever mattered is family. The family you are born into and the family you create. To family. To, to family. family. Now, for the reason I am here, as I alluded to earlier this evening, I am an ailing old man. I am dying. My doctor told me I do not have a very long. Daddy, no! My darling Fiona, please do not weep. Death belongs to us all, and I have lived more than most. It is time. However, I will not be able to die in peace if I cannot trust this family is taken care of. How do you mean? A new leader of this family must be chosen. Or we could take the money we've made, call it a day, and move on with our lives. Vincenzo! Fausto grabbed his cane and after summoning up every bit of strength he could, struck his son hard <laughs> in the kneecap. Vincenzo fell to the ground, writhing in pain. Ow! Ow! You ungrateful, simplistic fool! Do you think things are so easy? There is no walking away. This family has enemies, very powerful enemies, all over the world. To show weakness would mean assigning a death sentence to each and every person you love, including your unborn child. Do you only care for yourself? Do you have no loyalty? Uh, 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 to Daddy, uh, how do you plan on selecting a new leader of the family? We will convene at the villa. Giovanni is already there attending to important matters. It is imperative that we are together. Solidarity is strength. Well, I'm not going anywhere. My wife is about to give birth to our child. You talk about the importance of family. They are my family. I will not abandon them. You will do as you are instructed. The rest of the family will not suffer because of your foolish mistakes. Marrying Indica and having a baby with her is not a mistake. She is beneath us, Vincenzo. She has a no breeding, no class. She is a spazzatura. If she weren't to carry my grandchild, I'd have taken care of this problem by now. Don't you dare threaten her. Well, I agree with Daddy. Indica is nothing but an albatross and a liability. Daddy, I tried to get rid of her, but she was pretty much knocked up from day one. You bitch! Silencio! Vincenzo, you will accompany your family back to Alberta for this meeting. This is not negotiable. However, I am not a heartless man. I will postpone this summit until your new child is born. From what I hear, the birth is imminent. Vincenzo drained his glass of scotch, slammed it on a table, and stormed out of the room. Such dramatics. Anyway, it is getting late, Natalia. Would you please escort the old man to the gas chambers? It would be my pleasure, Mr. Valducci. Once Natalia and Fasto had left the library, Fiona poured herself another drink. Dimitri, we're going to have to get rid of Vincenzo. I know it's not ideal, but it's the only way I'll be able to take over my father's empire. I love my father, but he's old school. Having a woman in charge isn't exactly what he has in mind. 
but we can force his hand by eliminating my brother. It's the only way. Do you have preference on how we should go about that? <laughs> oh, surprise me. Just have Natalia do it. She's so efficient. As you wish. It was closing time at Destranger's bookstore. Pandora turned off the open sign, closed the blinds, locked the front door, and prepared to put away the latest shipment of metaphysical books. This was always her favourite time of the day. No customers, no questions. Just peaceful silence and her books. She lit a blunt just as Dante appeared from behind the cash register. Hey, Dante, you want to help me put these away? Sure. Dante placed his hands on the boxes of books. Smush. See. No. More. Early. Enough. Suddenly, the boxes began to shake. The books began to disappear and reappear in their correct spots on the shelves. Work that would have taken Pandora hours was done almost instantly. Uh, thanks, Dante, but since when do you use your powers? And for something so mundane, it's not like you. I'm a witch. Of course it's like me. You don't have to sit on your abilities either, Pandora. This isn't bewitched. We're special. Our lives aren't supposed to be as hard as everyone else's. Hey, don't get me wrong. I appreciate the help. I can actually get to bed at a reasonable hour now. It just took me by surprise since you made it a point to not use your abilities. People change, Pandora. They sure do. Well, I have a few other things to take care of, and I'll come upstairs. Are you trying to get rid of me? Of course not. I'm just going to smoke this blunt and finish closing up. I never want to get rid of you, baby. Pandora put the blunt into an ashtray and wrapped her arms around Dante. You know I love you, Ray. I guess. Well, you should, because I do. Being with you has been the best time of my life. I'm so glad you got up the nerve to tell me how you really felt. We make a great team. Always have. Don't ever doubt my love. You mean everything to me, baby. The couple kissed and Dante's mood lightened. While he headed back upstairs, Pandora relit the blunt and puffed away. These little outbursts were becoming more and more commonplace, and Pandora had no idea where they were coming from. When she wasn't with Dante, she was with Sister Indica. But beyond that, she really didn't have a social life. What more could he possibly want from her? He was also using his powers frequently, which was totally out of character. Maybe their relationship gave him the comfort to openly express his magical side. She tried to rationalise it, but her gut told her something was off. And as she'd learnt, her gut was never wrong. The worst part was she didn't have anyone to share her concerns with or confide in. Her mother Morgana would interfere, as was her nature, and Sister Indica was consumed with her own life, as usual. Plus, she'd probably just tell Pandora to leave Dante because she could do better. But could she? If so, why did her relationships never last longer than a few months? There wasn't exactly a lad of men beating down her door. She felt her lot in life was to be the perpetual sidekick and shoulder to crow on, forever the co-star of someone else's movie. Dante made her feel like the centre of the universe, but his moods would become so dark so suddenly that she was sometimes afraid. The constant push and pull was exhausting, but what was the alternative? Being alone again? She wiped tears from her eyes, stamped out the blunt, and pulled herself together. She couldn't have her mother picking up any odd vibration from her and ruining everything, so she calmed her mind and cast a spell that would block Morgana's psychic intrusions. The Pandora exhaled a sigh of relief. One less problem she'd have to deal with. She took a deep breath and made her way upstairs where Dante was waiting in bed.
When Sister Indica awoke, she could feel the tension all throughout the Valducci mansion. She knew of her husband's strained relationship with his father and Fasto's reputation for being a cruel bastard. Stress was not good for a woman about to give birth, so she left them all to their family business for a day of shopping. Her life was about to change forever, and she needed one last shopping spree before she traded diamonds for diapers. She had her driver drop her off at Destranger's bookstore, which was just around the corner from Goldie's. Sister Indico rang the bell for Pandora's apartment. Moments later, her dear friend was walking out the door wearing an ornate caftan. Work, Mama. Do you like this bitch? I do. I don't know whether to ask you for a tarot reading or fan you with palm fronds. Very powerful. Very mystical. Says the lady wearing a turban. How many wishes do you get, bitch? We taking a magic card with the Goldies? <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad we're doing this. We deserve some fun. Very soon, everything's going to be different. Are you nervous? To go shopping? Girl, please. You know what I mean, bitch. You're going to be someone's mother. This is huge, especially for you. I'm so proud, really. Thank you. I feel like a totally different person already. I can't wait to see what motherhood brings out of me. I almost feel like I'm watching myself from the outside. Like, who is this bitch? People don't change, Indica. They're just ignorant to their full being. You're learning new parts of yourself, but they've always been there. I'm not surprised in the slightest. Well, it shocks the hell out of me. The ladies walked through the front doors of Goldie's boutique and straight into Goldie's bar. Some things never change. Just because I can't have any booze doesn't mean we should break from tradition. I should order a vodka soda, though, just to fuck with them. With as much money as you spend here, they'll serve it to you. Not to mention being Vincenzo Valducci's wife. Girl, get ready for people to treat you very differently. Well, it's about fucking time. I've been this town's doormat long enough. Bartender, a vodka soda for my friend and a glass of club soda for me. On my tab. Moments later, the bartender placed their drinks before them. Well, girl, you know you can't put a glass in your hand without making a toast of some kind. A duh. To friendship. To you, Pandora. My life wouldn't be the same without you. I love you, girl. Damn, girl. You cut to the bone. Oh my god, are you crying? Shut up, bitch. After finishing their drinks, the ladies strolled leisurely through Golda's boutique, stopping in the jewelry section. No matter how much weight I gain, jewelry never lets me down. Can I get a closer look at that bracelet? The shop girl brought out a gold bracelet encrusted in emeralds and diamonds. Girl, that's beautiful, but you know green is my color, so... Do you like it? Bitch, what's not to like about a $40,000 piece of jewelry? Good. It's yours. Sure, girl. <laughs> Stupid. Sister Indica asked the shop girl to wrap it up and put it on her account. You weren't kidding? I never joke about jewelry, Pandora. I cannot accept that. It is way too much money. Pandora, I have more money than God. Before Pandora could respond, the pair spotted Rosie Bush. Oh, for fuck's sake. Not her. Not today. You want me to kick her ass? Oh my god, can you imagine? Now that would have been the perfect gift for my baby shower. Violence? <laughs> well, I guess I do owe you a wedding present, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they can hear you two cackling all the way in Jeffersonville. Ugh. Well, hello to you, too, Rosie. I would say you look well, but I don't want my unborn baby to think I'm a liar. Oh, are you pregnant? I couldn't tell. What's with the dark circles under your eyes? Did Jim finally wise up and start beating your ass? I'm just tired, Indica. Some of us actually work for a living. Do you remember what that's like? A good boss knows how to delegate. So how's Apollo Media Enterprises treating you? From the looks of it, like shit. Natalie and I are working on some very exciting projects. It's so nice working with someone I consider an equal. Refreshing, really. Well, I wish you, Natalie, and Apollo nothing but happiness and success. <laughs> Sorry, baby, I promised I wasn't going to lie. Rotten hell, Rosie. Sister Indica and Pandora stormed away, but stopped at the top of the marble staircase, which led down to the shoe department. Pandora, I don't feel too good. Indica, this isn't the trailer park. If you need to use the bathroom, 
It's over there. The women looked to the ground and noticed a puddle at Sister Indica's feet. Oh my god, I think my water just broke. Shit, girl, let's get you to the hospital. I'll call your driver. You two go ahead. I'll make sure a biohazard team clears the area of Sister Indica's toxic waste. You really are a cunt, Rosie Bush. So classy, Pandora. Birds of a feather, I guess. Rosie watched Pandora help Sister Indica walk carefully to the front of the store where her driver was waiting. She envied their relationship. As close as she and Joanne were, it just wasn't the same, especially these days. Just then, her legs began to shake and she felt disorientated. Before she could steady herself, she lost her balance and fell down the stairs. Ah! Oh! 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 Rosie laid unconscious in a pool of blood at the bottom of the staircase, a crowd of concerned employees and shoppers beginning to circle around her. When Rosie Bush regained consciousness, she was at Misty River General Hospital. She groaned and touched her head. It was bandaged. She tried to piece together the events that could have led her there. The last thing she remembered was arguing with Sister Indica and Pandora at Goldie's. Did Sister Indica attack her? No. She now remembered that Sister Indica's water broke and she was hurrying off to the hospital. She was confused, sore and weaker than she'd ever been. She finally blinked open her eyes. They were heavy and it took a lot of effort to keep them open. Her vision came into focus and she could see her hospital room and Jim Brinkman and Joanne Michaels sitting at her bedside. She tried to call out to them but found her voice almost non-existent. Rosie, you're awake. Thank God. D don't, don't try to speak. You've been through a lot. I brought you some ice chips. Rosie slowly opened her mouth so that Joanne could place some chips on her tongue. They were like slivers of heaven, soothing her dry throat. Just give me a look when you want more. I've got plenty. Now that you're awake, I'm going to go get the doctor. Jim raced out of the room, leaving Joanne and Rosie alone. You took quite the fall at Goldie's. They didn't think you'd wake up, but I knew you would. What a reversal. Me in bed and... You by my side. Thank you for being here. Your voice is shot. Here, have some more ice chips. Joanne placed more ice chips on Rosie's tongue as Jim Brinkman and Dr. Bradley Colfax entered the room. Miss Bush, you're awake. This is a fantastic improvement. What's going on? Why am I here? You sustained some injuries from a fall, you know, a concussion, broken ribs, sprained arm. I'm very surprised you regained consciousness so quickly. You must be a fighter. I've been known to fight, Doctor. We have uncovered the underlying reasons for your fall. I think we should have this conversation in private. Mr. Brinkman, Ms. Michaels, will you excuse us, please? Absolutely. Rosie, Joanne, and I will be right outside. No witnesses. This must be bad. I'm not going to sugarcoat this for you, Miss Bush. We ran a battery of tests after you were admitted. The lab delivered the results, and after conferring with some colleagues, we discovered that you have a very rare blood disease. A blood disease, huh? How do you suggest we treat it, Doctor? Unfortunately, this disease has no treatment plan. Something is currently being worked on, but it's highly experimental and not available for use. What are you saying? It's going to kill me since I can't have this experimental drug? I'm afraid so, Miss Bush. The disease is highly aggressive, so the timeline is short. The good news is you won't have to suffer, but uh, you really don't have a lot of time. I think you should make sure your affairs are in order. What would I need to do to get that drug? I am a very rich, very powerful woman. My father is the late Mayor Benjamin Davis. Certainly they could provide this drug to his dying daughter. There's a lot of red tape to cut through. I'm not sure you would have enough pull, but it's certainly worth a shot. Uh, I will make the introduction. Is there someone in your family I should call? Uh, my mother, Dosha Davis Brown. Jim Brinkman can put you in touch with her. 
We haven't spoken in years. I'm sorry to hear that. My God, I hate her. And my life will be in her hands. I can't bear it. We'll continue to monitor you and keep you comfortable. I'll let Detective Brinkman and your friend know they can see you again. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sorry, I didn't even get your name. I am Dr. Bradley Colfax. Colfax? That last name sounds so familiar. Misty River's a small town. Dr. Colfax left the room. Moments later, Jim and Joanne returned. What did he say, Rosie? Joanne, can I speak to Jim alone for a moment? Of course. I have some errands to run, so I'll come back later and see you, okay? Joanne gathered her things and left Jim and Rosie alone. As she headed towards the hospital elevator, the tingles returned. She quickly scanned the lobby for a quiet, private place. She saw there was a vacant room and quickly made her way to it, closing the door behind her and settling into a chair. She closed her eyes as the tingles made their way from the crown of her head to the base of her spine. When she reopened them, she stood and walked slowly into the bathroom. She flipped the lights on and reached into her purse. Moments later, her hair was smooth, her lipstick was on, and she was ready to leave. Meanwhile, in Rosie's room, Jim was sitting beside her, holding her hand in his. Tell me everything. I'm dying, Jim, and I don't have much time. I have a deadly blood disease that has no treatment or cure, except for something experimental that is almost impossible to get my hands on. Where is it? I'll go down there myself and demand it. I'll steal it. I don't care who I have to kill in order to get it. Jim, calm down. There is a possibility my mother can use her power and influence to get it for me. Dosha? Are you kidding me? She's a monster. I'm not thrilled about this either. But she's my only hope. Ooh, I want to break something. Or I could just burn this hospital to the ground. Isn't it just my luck? After almost a lifetime, we found our way back into each other's lives. Just when I was finally happy. It's over. Karma is cruel. If anyone deserves this, it's me. No one deserves this, Rosie. No one is totally good or evil. We're all complex creatures. But we're going to fight this. I love you with all my being, Rosie. I'm not letting you go. Not now, not ever. Sister Indica thrashed about on her hospital bed, screaming in pain, her contractions coming hard and quickly. She'd been in labour for hours and was more than ready for this baby to make its debut into the world. She was surrounded by Vincenzo Valducci, Pandora d'Estranger and Ethan Colfax, each taking their turn to comfort and be abused by the mother-to-be. Just breathe, hon. Like we learned in those classes, just breathe. Oh, shut the fuck up, Vinny. I know how to fucking breathe. Let me smash your balls in a vice and see you breathe your way out of it. (laughs) Oh, why did I ever have sex? Oh, God, just have the doctor sew me up. The kitchen is officially closed. I brought you some ice chips, sis. <sighs> if they don't have vodka in them, you can shove them up your ass. You'll get a vodka soda as soon as the baby is born. Fuck this baby. I need booze now. Hold on, girl. I just talked to the doctor. They're bringing you some drugs. Oh, thank God. Finally, somebody's doing something around here other than stare at me. Moments later, Dr. Bradley Colfax was rushing to Sister Indica's side with a syringe. He stabbed it into her ivy, and as he dispersed the concoction, Sister Indica began to relax. Forget Jesus. You're my lord and savior now. Bradley, where's Dr. Hernandez? He's my doctor. He's actually out of the country on some philanthropic excursion. Looks like you're stuck with me. I don't know how I feel about Ethan's older brother knowing what my pussy looks like. Oh, my God. (laughs) Just know I usually run a tighter ship down there, if you know what I mean. I'll close my eyes. How about that? 
Is there anything I can get for you, my love? A cup of tea? Bradley, can I have that? Yes, you may. I'll be right back. As Vincenzo was leaving, Morgana Prince was entering the room. Ugh, oh, I hope I'm not too late. The traffic around the commune was a bitch. That's the last time we let fish use our farm for one of their festivals. This thing is still inside me. I'd much rather be at the fish show. Then I got here just in time. Pandora, would you get your mother a cup of hot tea? I sure will, Ma. I'll come with you. Pandora, Ethan, and Dr. Colfax left Morgana and Sister Indica alone. I'm glad we're getting some time alone before the baby is here. I'd like to give you and the child a blessing, if I may. If you'd asked me a year ago, I'd have laughed in your face, but I know better now. Of course you can. We need all the blessings we can get. Every woman at the commune helped to create this. It's full of divine feminine energy. It's so beautiful when women can come together and support each other. You and the baby should visit sometime. Morgana reached into her purse and retrieved a jar. I'd love to. It's so beautiful out there in Jeffersonville. Morgana took a handful of the mixture as Sister Indica lifted her hospital gown to expose her round belly. She slathered it on slowly, and while she did, she spoke the words of a protection spell for both mother and child. Let no charm, let no evil harm this child or her mother. White light surrounds, white light protects. In the name of the goddess, I speak this incantation into existence. Ooh, it's warm. It's magic. So how long are you here for? For as long as you need me. I know you aren't close with your mother, but you need a mother figure with you now. I don't think I'll ever get a grandchild out of Pandora, so you're the next closest thing. You are so thoughtful. I'm going to take you up on that. I have, like, no fucking idea what I'm doing. A lot of it is instinct. You'll do just fine. Women have been doing this for millions of years. Vincenzo, Pandora, and Ethan returned with cups of tea and ice chips. Oh, oh fuck. More contractions. I think this is it. I feel like this kid wants out now. I'll get Brad. I can't believe it's finally time. I can! Squeeze my hand, Indica. We're going to get you through this. All of us. We're all here for you. Dr. Bradley Colfax came into the room and examined Sister Indica. He could tell she was ready to give birth, so he had a nurse wheel her into the delivery room. Vincenzo, Pandora, and Ethan sat in the waiting room while Morgana accompanied her inside. Almost an hour passed before Dr. Colfax appeared. It's a girl. Everything went smoothly. You can all go in and visit the mother and baby. Ethan, Indica asked you to bring her makeup bag. <laughs> of course she did. A couple of days had passed, but Rosie Bush wasn't feeling any better. She sat in a hospital bed, reliving every awful decision she'd made over the years, every grudge she'd refused to let go of, every bridge burned. She was so selfish, spoiled and entitled. A fatal disease was exactly what she deserved. There were so few bright spots, the way her father loved her, her relationship with Jim, and her friendship with Joanne. She'd have no time to make amends for all the wrong she'd done. This was it. The end. In a short time, the world would move on, and she'd be forgotten, like she never existed at all. She was dabbing away tears when the hospital room door opened. A tall, olive-skinned woman with jet-black hair walked in. She pulled a handkerchief from her purse and brushed it against her crisp, white suit. This place is filthy! Uh, hello, Mother. You're a mess. I can't even stand to look at you. 
Even in illness one must look their best. You are a Davis, Rosalind. Had I known you were coming, I'd put on some powder and lipstick. Of course you knew I was coming. You had the policeman call me. I had to cancel a lavish party at my villa in Mykonos to fly back to this godforsaken town. You're welcome. I didn't think you'd actually come. Oh, so you can run to the media and portray me as an awful, neglectful mother? I wouldn't give you the satisfaction. Mother, I didn't ask you here to fight. I'm sick. Very sick. And I need your help. <laughs> I'm no doctor. What help could I possibly provide? It's not like you need money. Your father made sure of that. Or have you wasted his fortune? <gasps> I should have known you were always so irresponsible. I have not wasted his fortune. And I run a media empire. I don't need anyone's money. It's more complicated than that. Cut to the chase, Rosalind. This place depresses me, and I'd like to spend as little time here as possible. I'm dying. I have a very rare and fatal blood disease. As of now, there is no cure, but an experimental drug has been developed. There's a lot of red tape to cut through, and sadly, I do not have the political influence that you do. It's life or death. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bothered you. Have you ever considered that this is God's will? Maybe you're being punished for all the wrong you've done. Maybe God saw what you did to your father and decided you deserve to pay for killing him. How dare you? Father's death was a suicide. But why did he kill himself, Rosalind? Do you really want me to say it out loud so others can hear? And you had the nerve to have Jim Brinkman call me? Of all people, you are selfish and thoughtless. I didn't realize what led Father to do what he did. He left a note, Rosalind. Do you want to read it? Your father did everything he could to make you happy. The things you asked him to do haunted him. You took my husband's life, and now you ask me to save yours? You deserve to die behind bars, right next to that bastard Jim Brinkman. Unbeknownst to them, Sister Indica had been listening outside Rose's room. She dramatically burst in, slamming the door behind her. Oh, what are you doing here? Indica, please. Not now. Please, just go. Like hell I will. I heard everything. Oh, great. More blackmail material. I hate to break it to you, Sister, but I'm dying, so don't waste your time. Like I said, I heard everything. I heard you ask your mother for help with that experimental drug. You could make one phone call and save your daughter's life, but you refuse to? I just gave birth to a baby girl, and I couldn't imagine letting her die, no matter what mistakes she'd made. You're despicable, Dosha, and you always have been. And you and your family are and will always be beneath me. Is that so? I suppose you missed my marriage announcement. Don't flatter yourself, darling. You don't exactly make Greek news. Let me catch you up to speed, then. Does the name Vincenzo Valducci ring a bell? Dasha clutched her chest. <gasps> I'll take that as a yes. Dasha, I'm sure if we dug around in your closet, we'd find some skeletons scattered amongst all that couture. Maybe I'll have my people do just that. This is a family matter, Indica. You have no place here. Please, just leave my daughter and I alone. Sister Indica pulled out her cell phone and placed a call. What are you doing? Who are you calling? Hello? Hi, this is Mrs. Indica Valducci. I'm going to call you back with the name of an experimental drug that I need access to immediately. Yes, it's urgent. Fabulous. My husband will be so thankful for your assistance. We'll make sure to thank you properly with a generous donation to your re-election campaign. <laughs> I'll be in touch soon. Well, that was easy. I guess you're no longer needed here, Dosha. How about you hop back on your private jet and go to hell? A stunned and speechless Dosha Davis Brown quickly left the hospital room, leaving Rosie and Sister Indica alone. I've always wanted to tell her to go to hell. You should try it sometime. It was a lot of fun. 
I'm confused. Why would you make that phone call for me? Well, geez, Rosie, can't I at least get a thank you? I'm in so much shock I forgot my manners. Thank you, Indica. I just don't understand why you'd help me. We're enemies. I thought you'd like nothing more than to see me dead. Oh, sure. There were times I'd have danced on your grave, but after becoming a mother and hearing the way Dosha spoke to you, well, let's just say I see you differently. I see a lot of things differently now. I don't exactly have the best relationship with my mother, either. I take it she wasn't here for the birth of your child. Congratulations, by the way. Nope. She couldn't be bothered. And unlike Dosha, she actually lives here. But she hates me so much she didn't even care to meet her grandchild. Or to be there for me as I gave birth. Are you responsible for your father's death, too? <laughs> no, that son of a bitch is still alive, unfortunately. But I'm sure she has a list of other things to blame me for. Ah, oh, whatever. It's her loss. That baby is so fucking cute. Have you picked a name? Yes. Angelica Liliana Valducci. That's beautiful. I'm actually about to get discharged so we can go home. Get me the name of that drug so I can have it sent to Dr. Colfax. Absolutely. So, does this mean we're friends now? Sure, why not? Haven't we both got enough enemies in this town? A wise person told me recently that it's really beautiful when women come together to support each other. I think I get it now. We're so quick to tear each other apart, fighting for our places on some imaginary ladder, like it gets us anywhere or means anything. I'd rather leave that to the men. I'm sure you've done a lot of thinking since you found out you're sick. Lord knows I have, since I found out I was pregnant. A sober mind is a clear mind. A nurse knocked on Rosie's door to let Sister Indica know that she and baby Angelica were able to go home. Finally. You know what that means. <laughs> a vodka soda and a blunt. You got that right, bitch. Even though Sister Indica had started a maternity leave, Rogue Nun Productions was abuzz with action. The phones were ringing off the hook. Celebrities and fans alike were calling to offer congratulations on the new baby, and reporters were asking for interviews. Ethan Colfax could barely keep up. While he was juggling different phone lines, Natalie Winter walked into the reception area where he was seated. Can you hold for a moment? How may I help you? I'm here to see Bianca Wolf. I don't see an appointment. <laughs> Darling, I don't need an appointment. Don't you know who I am? I know who you are. You need an appointment. Bianca's all booked up. I'm sorry. Natalie stormed past Ethan down the hall. He ran after her and put his hands in front of him. What do you think you're doing? I don't give a shit who you are or who you think you are. You don't get to walk around like you own the place. Come back when you have an appointment. Or better yet, how about you go to hell? Your sister Indica's assistant, all right. You're starting to sound just like her. I'm in a generous mood, so I'll forget about this little outburst, but you try that again, and trust me, I will make you regret it. Natalie pushed past Ethan and marched into Bianca Wolf's office. Excuse me? What do you think you're doing? I tried to stop her. Bianca, we need to talk. What on earth would we have to discuss? How Rogue Nun is absolutely demolishing Apollo Media Enterprises? Sure, let's chat about that. I've got all day. Can your lapdog leave us alone for this conversation? Trust me, you don't want anyone else to hear what I have to say. Ethan, would you mind? Fuck her, she just called me a dog. Ethan? Ethan reluctantly left the office, scowling at Natalie as he closed the door. Don't ever speak to my staff like that again. I feel like we're going to have a little battle where... Each of us is going to try and establish our dominance, so let me save us all a lot of time. I'm in charge here, and I plan on telling you why. Sit. The anchor started to sweat. The two women maintained eye contact as they found their respective seats. 
Bianca, I think you should come and work for me. Natalie, there's no way I'd quit my job. I love working here, and I get to run the company. Indica gives me a lot of control, and she pays me handsomely. I don't have any incentive to leave. Well, what if I told you that my little spies uncovered some information that could not only destroy your reputation, but send Rogue Nun Productions right into the toilet? You're bluffing. There isn't anything in my past that's damaging. Do you honestly think I would show up without proof? Come on, Bianca. I'm a professional. A professional what? Blackmailer? Yes. Then show it to me. Absolutely. Natalie reached into her purse and retrieved a manila folder filled with various documents. It's all right here. Hours and hours of research and interviews. We must have talked to, I don't know, 30 people. There's a lot for us to discuss, Bianca, or should I say, Victoria? That was your escorting name, wasn't it? Bianca began to weep, burying her face in her hands. <laughs> it's awful, I know. Can you imagine what your family would think? Your friends? Your advertisers? Oh my god, the advertisers. <laughs> Such a bunch of prudes. As you can see, it's really best for everyone involved if you came to work with me at AME. Rogue Nun would still exist, though it would certainly struggle and you get to keep your dignity everyone wins well except sister indica she definitely loses you're evil oh i'm not evil i'm just a woman who gets what she wants no matter who gets hurt in the process that makes me a bitch tell you what i'll let you consider my offer I'll be in touch soon for your answer. Bianca, when I call, say yes. Natalie Winter sauntered out of Bianca's office. Moments later, Ethan Colfax was rushing in. She sure left here with a shit-eating grin. What did she say to you? Oh my God, you're crying. Ethan, you must promise me you will never tell Indica that Natalie came here today. Will you promise me? She's got you rattled. Yes, of course. I'll keep this between us. I promise. Here, let me get you a drink. Make it a double. Sister Indica sat in the nursery, slowly rocking Angelica who had just finished a bottle and was falling asleep. She was such a good baby, very calm and quiet, which is just how Sister Indica was, from what her mother, Betty Sue, told her. Well, her adopted mother. She was also told that she was a painful birth, which Sister Indica now knew was a total lie. What other lies had Betty Sue told her? She hoped Lily Banks's letters, which she was now emotionally strong enough to read, could shed some truth, like rays of sunlight through storm clouds. There was no way Sister Indica could think of Angelica and not think of her own relationship with Betty Sue and Lily Banks. Since she was a mother now, she was starting to see life from a different perspective, and while she was still angry, she felt more compassion for both women. One of them carried her for nine months, and the other one took over for the next twenty years. Neither of them had to, but they did. That counted for something, didn't it? Soon, Angelica was fast asleep. Sister Indica carefully carried her over to the crib and placed her gently inside. You're in love with her already, aren't you? Oh my god, Morgana. I can't even describe it. The feelings of love, deeper than anything I've ever conceived, and the feelings of protection. I would literally kill someone with my bare hands if they hurt her. Like, chew through their fucking jugular vein. She's everything to me. I know exactly what you mean. That never goes away. It only gets stronger over time. You're going to be a good mommy. I know it. Is that the psychic part of you or the mother part of you talking? <laughs> a little 
little from column A, a little from column B. <laughs> I'm so glad you're here. It really means a lot to me, truly. I feel like I can actually take care of Angelica now. It's my pleasure. You've always felt like another daughter to me. You and Pandora have known each other forever. <laughs> it sure feels like it. Now that Angelica's down for a while, how about we go into your suite and smoke this celebratory joint I rolled for us? A Morgana, I want nothing more. The two women retire to the sitting area of Sister Indica's adjoining master suite. Would you like a drink? Oh, I suppose one won't kill me. Sister Indica went to the bar and mixed up two vodka sodas. I've honestly never felt so happy and in such a good place. It feels really strange, but comfortable at the same time. I don't think you're very good friends with contentment. But you'll get used to it. Contentment? <laughs> yeah, I don't know her. <laughs> well, you do know our little friend Mary Jane. She says she hasn't seen you in almost a year. She misses you. Light that bitch up! Morgana lit the expertly rolled joint and inhaled deeply. A few seconds later, she breathed out a large plume of smoke. Oh, oh, that was harsh. I think she's pissed at you. <coughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, she's mad. Very passive-aggressive, too, might I add. <coughs> you know what I think would be really fucking cool? If we read one of those letters Lily Banks left for you. Really? Now? Fuck it, why not? Sister Indica went over to a bureau drawer, dug around inside of it for a bit, then pulled out a ragged duct-taped shoebox. Here it is. How are we going to choose which letter? There's, like, so many. Let's spread them all out, like tarot cards. I'll place my hands over them and ask Lily to tell us which one is best to start with. Sister Indica removed the top of the shoebox, pulled out a stack of letters and spread them out on the coffee table. Morgana rubbed her hands together and then moved them slowly over the letters. Here, this one. She wants you to read this one first. Morgana handed Sister Indica a yellowed envelope. She took it and opened it carefully pulling out the decaying pieces of stationery with a surgeon's grace. Okay, here we go. Dear, Dear Fausto, Fausto, I'll never send this letter, but I must express myself so I don't burst. I've done so many things in my life that brought me shame, things I'll never forgive myself for. My heart is a well of remorse, yet I keep a smile lest anyone discover my true nature. I regret our affair. But I do not regret having Giovanni. One look at that sweet face told me he was meant to be in this world, even if we weren't meant to be together. Life has an odd way of unfolding, and we often see that some of our choices were the best in retrospect. How I wish I could have that perspective now, but I'm too firmly in the present and my heart is destroyed. There is nothing more devastating than losing a child either through death or separation. I know this pain intimately from giving up my twin girls years ago. I find small comfort that Vincenzo will never have to feel that pain now that he is raising our Giovanni. If he only knew that he was parenting his own brother. But to know that would expose a greater hurt. That his own child died shortly after being born. I understand your decision to switch the children. This keeps you in Giovanni's life, allows him to be raised a Valducci, but also protects Vincenzo from a pain he would surely never recover from. It also shields me from the pain of admitting to my husband that I had an affair and got pregnant by another man. The rational part of me understands all this, but the emotional side, which I admit, is currently in control of my pen is utterly broken. I forgive you for all of this, but I do not know if I will ever forgive myself. I will leave that in God's hands as I cry out for his mercy. Be kind to our son. Be kind to yours. One never knows how long they'll be with us. 
Lily. Sister Indica put down the letter, her mouth agape. Morgana lit another joint. Well, damn. I, I wish I never read this. Why did I read this? Why did I keep these fucking letters? Why do I need to know any of this? How am I supposed to keep this secret from my best friend? Why did she put this on me? You may never get the answers you're looking for, but I'm sure Lily had a good reason for leaving these letters with you. I'm going to burn these. I'm going to throw this fucking box in the fireplace and let these secrets turn to ash. That way, no one gets hurt. Sister Indica jumped to her feet and put a new log on the dwindling fire. I don't think you should do that. I think you should hide these letters and read them over time. You don't have to read them now, or even any time soon. But Lily is gone. This is all that's left of her. Sister Indica began to weep. Morgana took her in her arms. If you cry any longer, this joint is going to go out. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, in the bowels of the Valducci mansion, Fiona Valducci and Dmitri Sokolov were scheming. Now that Natalia has gotten Vincenzo out of the way, I need her to get Angelica the hell out of here. Daddy is being driven to his jet as we speak. A private nurse will make sure they both get back to Alberta safely. I will summon Natalia now. Dee, my darling, everything is falling into place perfectly. Soon, a new leader of the Valducci family will be named, and with Vincenzo gone, I'm the next in line. What about Giovanni? Oh, he's too young. And as progressive as I am, I can't foresee the council giving this position to a flaming queen. You have point. Any day now, all of this will be mine. <laughs> Joanne Michaels wanted the mansion to be spotless by the time Rosie Bush returned home from the hospital. Dr. Bradley Kovacs administered the experimental life-saving drug that Sister Indica procured, and it worked. Rosie's life had been saved, but she still needed to be monitored to make sure the drug had no adverse reactions. Joanne cleaned for hours, her hands raw from scrubbing. Exhausted, she decided to take a short break as she reclined on a chaise long. The tingles began. Oh, no. Not again. Soon, the tingles made their way down her spine and back up to her skull. Her tightly closed eyes softened, and when she opened them, she sprung to her feet and raced up the stairs to Rosie's master's suite. She flung open the closet doors and pushed aside gowns, dresses, and coats until she finally found Rosie's beautifully tailored suits. She selected a Chanel in blood red and snatched a pair of matching Jimmy Choo's. She quickly changed, did her hair, and applied a thick glare of red lipstick. She gazed at her reflection in the mirror. Suddenly, Tibetan bells rang throughout the mansion. Rosie had a visitor. Joanne, who was now Natalia, hurried down the stairs. When she flung open the grand mahogany doors, a small old man was standing there. Well, I'll be damned, Joanne. Look at you. Pretty as a freshly plucked peach in June. But remember, charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. What do you want? Ain't you gonna invite me in? It took me hours to get here to see you. Of course. Come inside. Wow, this is some house you done got here. I swear that rosy lady has enough money to burn a wet dog. But I got God up on my side. The pair entered the formal living room. Natalia went to the bar to prepare drinks. Why are you here? Honey, the bigger question is, what the hell is up with that crazy-ass Russian accent? You as loopy as a cross-eyed cowboy. It would take too long to explain, and I doubt you would be able to follow along. I will ask one last time. Why are you here? Okay, fine, I'll tell you. I felt so bad about knocking you upside the head with that rusty-ass pipe and putting you up in that cage, I didn't come to apologize. 
Apology accepted. Now finish your drink and leave. Wait a minute here. Me and Miss Lola done taught you way better manners than that. I'm a guest. Where's your hospitality at, baby? I am late for urgent appointment. Well, you just go ahead on then. I'll be sitting right here waiting. This place is so big, you won't even know I was here. You may leave now, on your own, or you may leave by force. The choice is yours. Force? You think you gonna force me into doing any damn thing? I think you done lost your ever-loving mind. I raised you, girl, and you will answer to me. Natalia gripped Ray's throat, his eyes widening with fear. Since when did you get so strong? I know what you did to Joanne. Not just hitting her with the pipe. I know everything. The disgusting things you did to her that she forced herself to forget so she could survive. You made Joanne weak and afraid. I am neither of those things. Who are you? The name is Natalia Beach. I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. Joanne loved it. She always loved it. She loved every minute of it. She was practically begging for it. Incorrect answer. Natalia's grip tightened, cutting off Ray's airway. His face quickly turned purple. He tried to gasp for air, trying to pry her hand away, but it was like a vice. Unrelenting. It wasn't long before he lost consciousness. Natalia felt for a pulse. It was faint. She grabbed Ray's head in both hands and twisted it until she heard the neck snap. She then dragged his lifeless body through the house and into Rose's garage. She selected her favourite car, a blood-red Lamborghini, which perfectly matched her outfit, and tossed Ray's corpse into the trunk. She sped away from Rose's mansion towards the Valduches. Dimitri needed her, and she was already late. It wasn't long before she arrived. She parked in a hidden underground structure and then dragged Ray's body into a freezer. Don't worry, Mr. Moyer. You have someone to keep you company. Next to Ray's body lay Vincenzo Valducci, his cold, dead eyes staring up at her. It was a tense evening. Pandora d'Estranger and Dante Fox had been arguing all night. When she tired of fighting, she grabbed a couple of blunts and went downstairs to the bookstore for some solace. No matter how badly she felt, d'Estranger's bookstore always comforted her. Sometimes she suspected that Morgana had placed some sort of spell over the place. She put on a small pot of herbal tea and lit a blunt. She pulled in the smoke, letting it wash away the stress of the day. How she wished things were like they were before. Dante used to be so kind, so calm. That's the person she fell in love with, whoever he was now. Well, she had no idea, and it frightened her. Had she made the biggest mistake of her life? It wasn't long before Dante was bounding down the stairs and bursting into the room. Dante, please, just bring your ass back upstairs. I need some time to myself. Don't you dare tell me what to do. Okay, something is completely fucking wrong with your ass. You sound like a goddamn demon. Is that what's going on with you? Did reading all those books on black magic fuck you the fuck up? I should have listened to my mother. She was right. She's always right. Dante waved his hand. Everything on the counter smashed to the ground. Dante, stop it! He waved both arms and shells of books fell over. The kettle began to howl as it boiled over. Dante looked at it, then looked at Pandora, and it was suddenly whizzing through the air directly at her. Pandora raised her hand to cover her face, and the kettle suddenly stopped in midair. It took her a second to realise she was now in control of it. She used her mind to direct the steaming kettle to the other side of the room. <laughs> the witch's powers have grown. Dante, you are the fucking devil. 
I don't know if you're possessed or something, but this shit ain't gonna fly with me. You need to get the fuck up out of my apartment and this bookstore. I'm not going anywhere, bitch. He put both of his hands in front of him, sending out a wave of energy that pressed Pandora against the wall. The blunt she was holding fell against a pile of books, starting a fire. The old books burned quickly and the fire began to spread. Pandora choked on smoke that was now beginning to fill the room. You motherfucker, you are not going to destroy this bookstore. It means everything to me. Pandora pictured the bookstore as it was before Dante knocked everything over and started the fire. She concentrated on that image so intensely that within a matter of seconds, everything was back to normal. Dante looked at her in shock. Don't fuck with me, Dante. I am that witch. I own you. Bitch, you can't even rent me. Now I'm getting the fuck out of here away from your evil ass. Pandora imagined Dante in heavy chains, unable to move. Suddenly they appeared and he was rooted in place. She wasn't sure how long this spell would last, so she fled through the front door and ran to her car. In her haste, she'd forgotten her keys. She imagined the door unlocking and the car starting. Before she knew it, it was happening. She got in the car and sped away, heading straight to the Valducci mansion. Sister Indica was finally dozing off to sleep after giving Angelica another bottle. She could easily delegate the task to one of the staff, or even Morgana, who was more than happy to help. But she wanted this bonding time with her daughter. She never felt close to her adopted mother, Betty Sue, so she wanted things to be different for Angelica. Suddenly, the doorbell chimed, waking Sister Indica. She threw on a silk robe, wrapped her long black hair in a turban, and hurried down the stairs. She didn't want whoever was at the front door to wake the baby. She planned to rake whoever it was across hot coals. When she angrily flung the front doors open, she saw a terrified and weeping Pandora. Her mood immediately softened as she took her dear friend in her arms. Oh my God, Pandora, what did he do to you? Come in. You look like you need a drink. The ladies made their way to the library, and Sister Indica immediately poured two glasses of scotch. <laughs> no vodka? Since when? I thought we could use something stronger. Here, drink this. Pandora drained the glass of scotch in one gulp. That bad, huh? I'll pour you another. Okay, here you go. Spill it. Before Pandora could begin, Morgana was rushing into the library. What happened, Pandora? Sister Indica handed Morgana a glass of scotch. I think you're going to need this. Okay, Pandora, out with it. It's Dante. He's like possessed by the devil or some shit. He attacked me with magic. Almost burned down my fucking bookstore. His voice even sounds all crazy and evil. Ma, you were right about him reading all those books on black magic. They fucked him up. Now is not the time for I told you so, so I'll save that for later. Right now I need to know that you're okay. Did he hurt you? He sure tried, but I was thankfully able to stop him. Ma, some crazy-ass powers came out of me that I didn't know I had. Like, really wild shit. You were fighting for your life. A witch is able to access higher levels of magic when faced with a life-or-death situation. Well, no shit. Stay here tonight. We're going to figure out a way to get rid of him tomorrow. Thanks, girl. He's been acting shady for a while, and I just didn't want to burden you with any of that. You were all big-bellied and pregnant. And, Ma, I didn't need you telling me how right you were. Plus, I was ashamed and embarrassed. I kept my heart guarded for so long, and when I let my walls down... I hook up with some fucking demon from hell. Pandora, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I'm your best friend. I am always here for you. You're never a burden. And I'm sorry that you didn't feel you could come to me. I never want you to go through such pain alone. Never again. Thank you, both of you. I'm already feeling better just getting it off my chest. I have something else that'll make you feel better. Morgana pulled a joint out of her house coat and lit it. The ladies passed it around, drank their scotch, and laughed. Laughter was always the best medicine. 
But the weed didn't hurt. You guys, let's go upstairs. Angelica looks so adorable. You just have to see her, Pandora. Yes, let me see that baby. The ladies talked and laughed all the way to the nursery. Sister Indica crept in and switched on the light. She's sleeping. We have to be quiet. When the three women looked into Angelica's crib, they collectively gasped. <gasps> oh my what the god! The fuck! The baby was gone. What the fuck is going on? Don't panic. Maybe one of your staff has her. No, she's gone. Someone took her. Someone fucking took my baby! Moments later, Fiona Valducci was walking into the nursery. Do you mind? Some of us are trying to get some sleep around here. Fiona, Angelica's gone. She's with her father. They left. What the fuck do you mean they left? Vincenzo wouldn't do that to me. You give my brother too much credit, Indiga. He's on his way out of the country, and there's nothing you can do to stop him. Your days as Mrs. Valducci are coming to a close. I'm sure annulment papers will be arriving in the mail shortly. Oh, I hate to be the one to break the news to you. A actually, no. No, I don't. <laughs> I don't believe a word you're saying. Sister Indica raced into the joining master suite and went to Vincenzo's closet. All his clothes and shoes were gone. She checked the bureau drawers as well. They, too, were completely cleared out. Fiona must be right. Fiona, Pandora, and Morgana joined her in the suite. He never really loved you, you know. You were just a temporary distraction. And you bred him an heir? But of course you did. Isn't that all your people know how to do? Breed? Filled with rage, Sister Indica slapped Fiona hard across the face. You bitch! I know with every part of me that Vincenzo loves me and our baby, and he'd choose us over this rotten family in a heartbeat. You never bothered to get to know your brother, but I did, and I know him better than anyone. I also know that when something doesn't make sense, it's not true. You're hiding something, Fiona, and I'm going to find out what it is. But I'm going to go find my baby and my husband first. Oh, okay, Endica, if you say so. Good luck with that. <laughs> Fiona left the three women alone in the master suite. Sister Indica began to sob. We're going to find her, don't you worry. We're not just friends, Indica. We're witches. Ma, is there anything in here that Angelica touched? Morgana ran to the crib and grabbed the blanket she was brought home in. Here you go. Pandora took the blanket in her hands, closed her eyes, and allowed the surge of psychic energy to flow through her. Images began flashing through her mind. She saw Angelica on a private jet with a woman in a nurse's uniform and an old man. She also saw a large meat locker and two dead bodies. One of them was Vincenzo. Pandora could never tell Sister Indica the truth. The grief of losing Vincenzo would get in the way of saving Angelica. She mentally asked to see the plane again, and the images came flooding back. She looked closer, trying to find any clues to identify the old man. She couldn't see his face, but she did see a cane. Okay, she's on a plane. It's a private jet. And there's an old man with a cane. That's Fausto, Vincenzo and Fiona's father. He was just here for some family business, and he's going back to Alberta tonight in his private jet. Pandora, we've got to go after them. Morgana, do you want to come with us? No, I'm going to stay here. I have some other business to take care of. You two go ahead. Hurry. I'll give you the keys to my mansion. I don't want you anywhere near Fiona. She's part of all this, but I'll deal with her later. Help me get dressed. We don't have a second to waste. Natalie Winter was loudly playing jazz music and dancing around her office when Rosie Bush walked in. All of her dreams were set to come true. She finally had the goods that would take down Rogue Nun Productions, making Apollo Media Enterprises Misty River's number one media empire. Nothing could stop her now. Rosie, you're not dead. Fabulous. Come in, we're celebrating. Natalie danced over to Rosie and handed her a glass of champagne. I'm on a second bottle. I can tell. So what are we celebrating? Your health, of course. <laughs> I'm so glad you're okay. I was really nervous there for a bit. 
But you didn't know I was coming in, so there must be something else going on. Oh, Rosie, you're right. I dug up some dirt on Bianca Wolf that is so damning, so mind-blowing that it will destroy Rogue Nun Productions forever. <laughs> Natalie, that, that's amazing. I gotta be honest, Rosie, I'm starting to doubt your sincerity. This is huge news for us, both as a company and as people who simply hate Sister Indica. <laughs> this is everything we've been working for. Why aren't you more elated? Natalie, I hate to ask this of you, but can you destroy that information you have on Bianca? Destroy it? Rosie, have you lost your fucking mind? I know you suffered a head injury when you fell down those stairs, but my God, are you sure you're well enough to be released? There's nothing wrong with my mind, Natalie. In fact, for the first time, and I don't even know how long, I'm seeing things very clearly. You know, Natalie, jealousy, hatred, and vengeance can be blinding. For your own good, you need to work through your anger. It's the only way you'll become a whole person. Natalie switched off the music. You have a lot of nerves speaking to me that way. When you were at your lowest, I threw you a lifeline, and how do you repay me? You're shitting all over my happiness, Rosie. I've just achieved a goal that has been in the works for years. And you think I'm going to just walk away from it? Rosie, you are insane. Where the hell is this change of heart coming from? I wouldn't be standing here right now if it wasn't for Sister Indica. She used her influence to get me the drug that saved my life. She did what my own mother refused to do. I owe her everything. Stopping you from destroying one of her best friends, and in turn her company, is the very least I can do for her. There's nothing you can do to stop me, Rosie, so I suggest you get on board or get the hell out of here. You're either with me or you're against me, and... You don't want to be against me. I will destroy you. <laughs> if only I had a dollar for every time someone has told me that. Natalie, listen closely. You may be a formidable woman. In fact, you are. But I tend to stay one step ahead of people. You will destroy the information you have on Bianca Wolf and anything you have on Sister Indica. If you don't, I'll be forced to release the information I've collected on you. You see, Natalie, when a person is so hell-bent on revenge, as you are with everyone you view as your competition, it usually means they are overcompensating for some demons in their own past. The day after you offered me this position, I had my people do some very thorough research on you, and the information I uncovered... Well, let's just say it's highly unflattering. And illegal. So go ahead and push me, Natalie. But remember, when I push back, I push back hard. You fucking bitch. I never should have hired you. About that, I actually came in today to tender my resignation. I've decided to pursue other dreams. I'll leave the Battle of the Media Moguls to you and in Indica. Thank you for this opportunity, Natalie. This isn't over, Rosie. <laughs> oh, yes, it is. I always win. And don't you forget it. Rosie smiled and left Natalie's office. She took the elevator downstairs and jumped into Jim Brinkman's car, not even bothering to clean out her office. I expected to see you with some boxes. Natalie can throw it all away. I don't want any of it. It's all part of my old life and... I only want to look forward with you.
Once the Valducci private jet reached high enough altitude, the pilot announced that Sister Indica and Pandora could move freely about the cabin. The trip was a tense one for them both, and sitting still was making it worse. Sister Indica paced back and forth, her mind reeling. Even though she had Pandora by her side, she felt more alone than ever before. Where was Vincenzo? Fiona often scolded him for his weakness, and for the first time she agreed with her. How could he let his father kidnap his child? How could he allow his family to treat her this way? Okay, your pacing is starting to drive me crazy. Here, smoke this. Pandora lit a blunt, pulled on it, and then passed it to Sister Indica, who accepted it with enthusiasm. I guess that's one bright side to have in your own plane. You can smoke whenever and whatever you please. Who gives a shit? I hate these fucking people, Pandora. I want them all dead. I know you do, girl. We're gonna get Angelica back, don't you worry. And we'll figure out what else is going on with these twisted motherfuckers. It's not possible that Vinny has any part in this. He wouldn't do this to me, Pandora. Something is seriously wrong. I just know it. Do your powers tell you anything? Can you ask Lily Banks or some other ghost what the hell is going on? It's not so simple. I can only tell you what I see, and I did that already when I held Angelica's blanket. Well, what if I gave you something else? Something of his. Would that help? Well, it's definitely worth a shot. Sister Indica frantically searched the plane for any object that belonged to Vincenzo directly. She found a box of his cigars. There was one inside that was partially smoked. Here. He smoked it, so it even has his saliva on it. This is witchcraft, not CSI. Pandora held the cigar in her hand and allowed the psychic currents to ripple through her. A kaleidoscope of images flashed before her eyes. She could see Joanne Michaels strangling and killing Vincenzo and dragging his body into the freezer. She saw Fiona and Dimitri talking and Dimitri pulling on some strange device. Did that mean they were behind Vincenzo's murder? So, are you getting anything? Nothing's clear. I'm sorry. Maybe after my fight with Dante, I used up my powers or some shit. Maybe they got a recharge. Girl, I tell you, it was just like some crazy-ass movie. I can't believe I let myself fall in love with that psycho. You know my track record, so I won't judge you at all for being with Dante. Suddenly, the plane hit a patch of turbulence. Oh, Jesus. That was scary. Let's sit back down. You want to hear something really fucking crazy? Morgana and I read one of Lily's letters. You remember the ones in that box Greta Schumacher brought over? You mean the box of letters that proved I was actually a psychic and not full of shit like you thought I was all these years? Yeah, I remember. Giovanni is Lily Banks' son with Fausto, not Vinny. Apparently, Vinny's child died the same day Lily was giving birth to Giovanni, so they switched the babies. Vinny has no idea Giovanni is actually his little brother. Well, at least you don't have to think that Lily and Vincenzo were fucking, because that thought always bothered me. I gotta be honest with you. Oh, the idea made me sick. As fucked up as this whole situation was, yeah, that part was a relief. I wonder what other life-altering secrets are in the rest of those letters. The plane hit an even rougher patch of turbulence, tossing the ladies around in their seats. Okay, now I'm starting to get nervous. What if Fausto had someone tamper with the plane? It's just some crazy jet streams or something. It's also a pretty small plane, so you feel every little bump. That's it. There was a loud bang, and suddenly the lights in the cabin went off. Jet streams, you said? Sister Indica opened the window shade and saw that the motor was on fire. She unbuckled herself and went to the other side of the plane. She flung open a window shade and saw that the other motor was also on fire. Oh my fucking god, Pandora! The engines are on fire! We're gonna crash! Pandora jumped out of her seat and ran towards the cockpit. She banged on the pilot's door. Hello? Hello? The fucking engines are on fire! What the fuck is going on? We gotta land this plane or we're all gonna die. Are you fucking listening to me? She banged so hard that the door unlatched and swung open. The cockpit was empty. Oh shit. Oh shit! Pandora jumped into the pilot's seat and pulled on the steering wheel like she'd seen in countless movies. It had no impact on the trajectory of the plane. They were heading downward at an alarming rate. Pandora tried using her newfound abilities by... Imagining the plane rising itself and the engine fire ceasing, but nothing happened. It was almost like a greater magical force was at work. 
Pandora raced back into the cabin and grabbed Sister Indica. Bitch, I love you. The plane's descent increased and suddenly the jet crashed into the side of a tall Canadian mountain, a fireball illuminating the night sky. Dante Fox was in the basement of Destranger's bookstore, standing motionless in front of an elaborate diorama of the Canadian Rockies. A miniature plane was sticking out of one of the mountains, complete with flickering flames and plumes of smoke. He felt the completion of his spell all throughout his body. Sister Indica's plane, which was carrying Pandora, had crashed into a fiery blaze. He couldn't feel whether or not they were dead, but in an accident that severe, there were never any survivors. He laughed a satisfied laugh as the basement doors flew open with the force of a stick of dynamite. It was Morgana Prince. So you want to pick a fight with a witch, do you? Well, when you fuck with my daughter, you fuck with me. Get the hell out of here, old woman, before I crush your bones into the dust. You just couldn't leave well enough alone. I warned you against learning black magic. It's taken you over, Dante. Suddenly, Morgana received a psychic flash. Sister Indica and Pandora were in danger, and it was Dante's fault. What have you done to Pandora? Talk about a delayed reaction. You're too late. There's nothing you can do for your daughter or Sister Indica. What did you do? You can't turn back time, Morgana. No witch is that powerful. Morgana noticed the diorama and just how accurate it was to the topography of Alberta. She then saw the plane on fire, a plane that looked just like the Valducci private jet. You bargain basement spawn of the devil. You crashed their plane. <laughs> Morgana threw her arms in front of her, releasing a surge of energy that wrapped around Dante's throat, strangling him. You will never find them. They're not here anymore. Neither are you. Morgana gnarled her fists, causing Dante's bones to break in countless places. Blood poured from his eyes and mouth, and he collapsed to the floor, dead. She placed her hands to her temples, concentrated, and then waved an arm, everything in her view disappearing. The diorama, Dante's body, the blood, everything was gone. Pandora and Indica, I'm coming for you. I'll save you. Just hold on. Mama's on her way! Blazed All Our Lives, Desperate Business is brought to you by Rogue Nun Productions. Written, directed, produced by and starring Sister Indica. Also starring Rosie Bush. Joanne Michaels and Pandora Destranger, featuring Divine Grace as Fiona Valducci, Freddie Prince Charming as Detective Jim Brinkman, K.D. Christian Starr as Bianca Wolf, Gino Oberlander Johnson as Ethan Colfax, Sister Gladiola Gladrags as Dimitri Socolo, Stephen Bacos as Vincenzo Valducci. Eve All as Dante Fox, Pissy Miles as Natalie Winter, Ivor Turner as Morgana Prince, Tragique Destranger as Fasto Valducci, Lola Van Horn as Zoe Robinson, Sister Divine Ho as Ray Moya, Tracy Payne Black as Doja Davis Brown, Logan Lowry Rasmussen as Dr. Bradley Koufax, Sarah Bigot as Lily Banks, and narrated by yours truly, Sister Bang Bang.